Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on uh, technology and human rights in time of uh, crisis. As you uh, can see from this, this image, we have uh, through this uh, visual metaphor as uh, illustration of position of individuals in time of crisis. It is a very unique moment where uh, our society is under the threat and when uh, many um, human rights and many individual rights are uh, suspended or affected. As we'll see during our discussion, uh, we refer to the fundamental human rights like freedom of expression, freedom of movement, uh, privacy, but also broader extended human rights related to jobs, education and access to health. While uh, fighting the pandemic, uh, pandemic definitely takes priority, emergency measures should remain proportional and they also shouldn't exceed necessity which is uh, needed in this difficult time. This is the context for our, for our discussion. What is the position of individual and what is current situation with human rights when it comes to to the crisis situation. Today with us, we have really uh, um, prominent uh, and uh, extremely well-informed uh, group of experts, uh, which will reflect on different aspects of uh, human rights and technology in crisis time. We are particularly honored to have today with us Ambassador Elisabeth Ticci Fiesberger, permanent representative of Austria, to the United Nations office in Geneva and the currently uh, president of the human UN United Nations Human Rights Council. With us is Mark Lemon, executive director of the Universal Human uh, Universal Rights Group and long-time uh, uh, proponent of protection of human rights including a right to uh, to uh, um, proper environment and climate, which uh, Mark uh, uh, basically introduced through the campaign with Maldives about 10 years ago. With us is Nanjira Sambuli from uh, Nairobi. She's my colleague from the UN High Level Panel uh, on Digital Cooperation. Uh, and she's a researcher, policy analyst, and very passionate uh, uh, advocate for the core human rights, for the question of dignity in digital era. With us here today is uh, Scott, uh, Scott Camp, uh, Campbell, Senior Human Rights and Technology Officer of the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Scott covers digital issues uh, within, the, within the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And uh, last but not least, uh, with us is uh, Peter uh, Michek, General Counsel at Access Now. For those of you who are involved in human rights field and digital field, there is no need to uh, introduce Peter and the work of Access Now. As you can see, we have today a full house. And uh, before we kick off our discussion, I would like to ask you to take a moment and uh, vote in our poll that should be that is now visible on your screens answering a few questions just to have some sort of a temperature of the of the room don't confuse it with the with the body temperature which is now in the focus on uh, many of uh, people who are concerned about uh, coronavirus uh, and here is the question is which human rights is at the most risk in the current crisis situation privacy freedom of expression a right to information a right to work a right to education and the freedom of movement. We'll take, it will take a few minutes uh, before I invite Ambassador to deliver her introductory statement and to set the stage for our discussion. It seems that there is a clear uh, lead on the question of privacy after that freedom of movement, obviously with lockdown across the world and uh, surprisingly low uh, uh, votes for the right to education, right to work, right to information, and freedom of expression. It seems that uh, at least based on what we are uh, hearing uh, uh, here, there will be a uh, focus on the definitely question of uh, uh, protection of privacy, protection of data, and freedom of movement. Now, without uh, further ado, I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Elizabeth Ticci Fieselberger uh, to deliver um, uh, her um, keynote, uh, keynote and the introductory statement. Ambassador, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Definitely very well. Please okay. go ahead. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. It's nice to see real people again, and now that we are confined so much to our houses. And I understand there is quite a lot of, quite a big community who has joined us. So welcome to everybody. This is really a pleasure. They tell us that we are living through the biggest crisis of our generation, bigger even than the world economic crisis, which we had in 2008. Uh, the coronavirus has spread now, as far as I know, to 194 countries. That is more than the United Nations have member states. And in order to make our lives more bearable, we are now all engaging in this brave new world of new technologies. And we're all somehow participating as the guinea pigs in a large scale social experiment. We work from home. Um, we keep in touch with each other. We get the information we need. Um, we are sheepishly, actually, following all the instructions we get from authorities without the usual reflex of questioning them, uh, which also shows that once people have a choice between health and privacy, they will probably go for health, which is understandable and the right thing to do, but which also raises questions. And I think this is what our analysis today will all be about. Um, in a very short spell of time, we have found out that our freedom of movement has been restricted, that our right of assembly has been restricted, at least physical assembly. In some countries like Switzerland, we're allowed to be groups of a maximum of five. In other countries, it's even less. Um, the uh, access to education has actually been rephrased in that entire schools and universities have been replaced by online activities. As for the right to health, it is more or less restricted to corona only now, don't have any other illnesses. Uh, many jobs and livelihoods are lost or at risk. And all our privacy is, of course, being restricted because we are acting mainly on the Internet. And what is more, we are told that the most successful countries in fighting and containing the coronavirus are those who orchestrated um, extensive testing, of course, and honest reporting, but also who got their populations to auto-report on blood temperatures and other medical conditions. Uh, they have all accepted that they are being tracked, that their smartphones are being tracked so as to find out whether they accept uh, or that they respect quarantines. People accept, for, for example, in some countries that there are QR codes uh, with which you are tracked if you enter the particular car or a particular subway. So if something happens, they can find out who was in contact with whom. There are all kinds of apps on offer, including in my country, for example, by the Red Cross, where you can find out about your own medical data and, and share them. So this is all a little bit of science fiction, or at least we thought this would be science fiction a few years ago, because for the first time in human history, probably, technology makes it possible to monitor everybody at the same time, all the time. Now, there is a problematic potential in all these technologies, and you may know that the Human Rights Council has an advisory committee, and that this advisory committee is currently uh, conducting a study exactly on the question of human rights and new technologies, but I feel that they will have to somehow update the study they are doing in the light of the corona crisis. But what they have been saying already is that we have to look not at the effects of individual technologies only, but rather at this broad wave of technological innovation which is sweeping across many areas of uh, human knowledge at this stage. Now the so-called fourth industrial revolution, that's the one where the human being is being replaced by the computer very often without the human being even knowing how the algorithms work. That brings a lot of human rights issues, of course. Whenever you see humans and machines converging, uh, robots, genetic engineering, the biological and the chemical revolution, neuroscience, all these things um, have to be looked very carefully also from a human rights point of view. Um, I read in The Economist last week that there was a possible watershed coming in the history of surveillance. 
uh, in that there would be a transition from the over the skin to the under the skin surveillance, for example, by biometric bracelets uh, sharing all kinds of um, information, but of course also being able to drastically shorten the chain of infection. Uh, we know that uh, these things have been put in place in some Eastern Asian countries, but not only there. We're also told that some in some Western countries, security agencies start using technologies which are normally reserved for battling terrorists. So this is where we are. There is a kind, a number of headaches that we have in developed industrial countries like mine, but even more so in some of the poorer parts of the world. The High Commissioner has recently highlighted that the severe human rights issues triggered by the coronavirus, in particular in countries with weaker health systems, uh, in countries where they have sanctions, which might actually make it more difficult to have access to vital medical supplies. And she has... She has all Can you still hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can. Constantly uh, okay. speaking here. Yes, Suddenly we there can. Was, there was a noise and then I, I couldn't see anybody anymore so, except myself, so I thought I was isolated again. Um, yeah, the High Commissioner recently said that there were high risk issues in countries with weak health systems. And interestingly, she also appealed to countries to accept humanitarian assistance if offered by others. The chairpersons of the 10 UN treaty bodies have equally warned that there are risks, and they said there are even risks for the right to life. The risks are even bigger for the vulnerable groups, for older people, people with disabilities, minorities, indigenous people, and then the whole population of refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, and displaced persons, obviously for detainees and adoptees, homeless people, and people living in poverty. You may have heard that the Director General of UNICEF, Azule, recently recalled that, for example, a huge majority of children today who had to stay at home are increasingly at risk physically, physically and psychologically because this um, concentrating many people in small home triggers aggressions and that many children who depend on school meals suddenly don't get these school meals anymore and are probably more at risk than previously of being forced to work or probably even recruited as child soldiers. Women are very much at risk because in many societies they are the main caregivers. And there are specific risks coming with the usual problems of social media we have. We know about fake news, but this time fake news can be can put your life in danger, for example, when they offer counterfeit medical supplies. And the coronavirus-specific hate speech uh, also leads to more scapegoating, also to more discrimination. We have seen that at first Asians were discriminated in Western countries, and now it seems that white people are discriminated against, sometimes not only in Asia, but also in African countries, because there are misleading informations around that the virus spreads only in Europe and in Latin America, as we were told recently. Um, these are many of the problems we have to deal with at short notice, but we should also look at the longer term consequences. What will happen once the crisis is over? What kind of world will we live in once the storm has passed? Uh, there will be a complex situation, but we know that emergencies have a habit of fast-forwarding historical processes, and then these consequences don't necessarily go away. They be emergency measures may well become a fixture of life, in particular if some people say that the next uh, emergency is just around the corner. I think this is going to be discussed by other panelists, and I have already used up some time now, for which I apologize. I would only say in my present capacity as the president of the Human Rights Council, it is, even if it doesn't have physical meetings, it's not a virtual council. Uh, and the human rights work of the United Nations does go on and must go on. It's very important that this human rights work does not become a victim of the emergency. 
uh, the council must fulfill its mandates and so must its special procedure mandate holders and they do. You have seen that the High Commissioner has taken the floor, you have probably seen that various of the special mandate holders have made press statements where they were pinpointing particular problems which they could see. I have already mentioned that the advisory committee is dealing with this question of human rights and new technologies. Uh, but at short notice, we have the question, what can we do, uh, in particular, if we can't hold physical meetings in the next months to come? It just so happens that when the Human Rights Council was first set up with the so-called IB package, which is kind of the housekeeping rules, nobody thought of the situation we're having now. And as opposed to other international organizations, there's no such thing as a written procedure. At the moment, they're discussing exactly these problems in New York. What can the Security Council do if it can't meet? What can the General Assembly do if it can't meet but has to take urgent decisions? And what we see from New York is that these discussions are not easy. So we're watching them. The question is, uh, is everything they do there a precedent for us? Or could the Human Rights Council develop different ideas? If you have any good ideas, I give a lot of pennies for them. We are very interested in anything that can keep this work going. Uh, and I think it is very important because there are many issues at stake. Of course, the big question is how long will it all last? Um, because we have a number of resolutions on the table of the Human Rights Council. They were brought in, tabled, just before the suspension. Some of these resolutions are on very important and serious matters. And the question now is, what can we do in order for the Human Rights Council to act on them? So uh, I will be listening to all of you, and I'll be very interested to hear what you have to say, in particular on these final questions, which I have to add. So having said that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for an excellent uh, uh, setting of the stage for our discussion and mapping the field. And you mentioned a few quite important issues like uh, question of trade-offs and balances. I'm sure that that issue will be coming in our discussion. As always, we prefer to have it a win-win solution. But we are at a time where we have to make some painful trade-offs uh, when it comes, you mentioned, for example, question of health and privacy or uh, you mentioned uh, the other the other the other delicate human rights and uh, your statement particularly was useful on the on this comprehensive holistic approach to human rights and your invitation for ideas and inputs how we can move forward i'm sure that uh, our audience is inspired and we'll hear from our speakers more on that we move directly into discussion with uh, with peter uh, peter access now reacted promptly to the crisis and human rights you publish even a report on the data protection and privacy of a Zoom platform. Here is uh, some sort of uh, indication about raising the, on the visits of the news website and apps. Therefore, our access to information, thirst for information, for data has been moving uh, online. Peter, could you just give us a few reflections on the question of uh, that interplay on data protection and privacy our audience, as we heard, is very interested in uh, in this issue. You may also reflect on a few practical issues uh, following the call from Ambassador to give some new, fresh ideas how to move on. Peter, floor is yours. Absolutely. Thank you, Jovan, and, and uh, thank you, Ambassador, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I do want to highlight uh, some of the issues you raised. Uh, but just to, just to be very clear, we believe that protecting digital rights also can promote public health, that um, digital rights can be a partner in health. And uh, this is a good time and a, a crucial time to focus on how human rights apply online, uh, even in times of crisis. And uh, what we're seeing is that, uh, as the ambassador pointed out, we are all moving online. Uh, there's no choice, there's no other option. And uh, I think this is crystallizing for a lot of people um, the, the need to you know, clarify and uh, ensure better protection uh, for everything we do online uh, and especially our, our personal data. Um, so health information, as everyone knows, is, is private and sensitive. Um, it's you know, generally uh, you know, one of the first things that people think of when it comes to uh, protecting our data. It describes ourselves, our bodies, 
um, our unique characteristics. And, and this data is protected. It should be protected in data protection laws. Um, what we're saying, though, and what we see in the data protection laws and, and other measures is that there are exceptions for the use of health data uh, in, in order to protect public health. Um, there are uh, exceptions to personal data protection um, and privacy when it comes to crisis situations like we're facing now. Uh, so we are uh, making clear that the question is not if governments can use health data to fight the crisis, but how this can be done. And uh, so those are the questions that we want to put forward, and we believe that civil society uh, can and should be brought along in order to help public authorities uh, shape appropriate responses uh, and, and use tech responsibly. So again, data can and should be used. What matters is, is how, uh, and that includes the purpose for which you're, you're collecting and, and gathering and using and processing this data, um, for how long, um, you know, as the ambassador said, these measures tend to stay in place um, once rolled out. Um, any new technology that's going to be experimenting, um, experimented with now um, could be you know, applied for the long term. Uh, how long is this data going to be held and by whom? And then under whose oversight and under what you know, openness and, and transparency safeguards are these uh, public-private partnerships going to take place? Um, is this data going to be collected and processed? So we're focusing on um, you know, not if data can be used, but how. How can it be collected and used responsibly? And uh, we're working with other civil society. Uh, as, as Jovan mentioned, we are making targeted interventions um, with uh, key private sector actors like uh, we did with Zoom. Uh, we wrote to them after noticing they do not issue a transparency report. Um, on third-party requests for user data. This is standard practice in the industry, and, and we don't see it yet um, from this company, and so we see that as, as a gap. And um, similarly, we are going to governments, um, not just Access Now, but civil society is working together um, as we speak on initiatives focused on what governments can do. Uh, we're looking at the collection and use of health data, um, as well as tracking and geolocation and uh, public-private partnerships. Those are three areas where Access Now is focusing. Um, but uh, for for civil society broadly, I think I can I can speak um, and uh, look forward to other interventions, including from Nigeria. Uh, but uh, we see that uh, human rights law and international law certainly does apply, um, even in emergency situations. Um, there are uh, procedures uh, set out for how states can and should uh, proceed uh, with limited derogations um, from the protections of privacy and other human rights. Um, but any surveillance measures adopted to address the pandemic must be lawful, must be necessary, and proportionate. Um, so again, we're getting to how um, governments can uh, increase their monitoring or, or processing of health data. Um, lawful, necessary, and proportionate. Time bound. Uh, we want to see sunset clauses, maybe with renewals. Um, we want uh, to know how this data is going to be protected, um, if there are new databases being set up. Um, what uh, is being done, you are creating honeypots of data, and we are sure that uh, malicious third parties and others are going to be looking to access this data. Uh, we need this work to be purpose-driven and limited. Uh, and uh, collecting too much data is not going to be efficient. It's not going to be helpful. We saw that in the Ebola crisis response, um, that just collecting it all is, is not uh, appropriate, and it puts people's privacy and uh, security at risk while uh, not necessarily uh, creating the efficiencies that, that we look to. Peter, um, just one, yeah. one reflect on, uh, which is extremely important, is how uh, we have this you listed some of the activities just for the for the next row of discussion to make useful uh, input for uh, for ambassador and for the council we have been discussing ne uh, necessary and proportional measure for quite some time there are many books access now did a fascinating work on it uh, is there a feeling and this is a question for all panelists that in a way history accelerates we have to give some uh, really more solid meaning to the those general principles which are important yep. as 
a general principle. Therefore, maybe later on in the second iteration, we can we can go uh, uh, more into the into the focus how to do it. And I know access now, in addition to protecting the principles, is very practical when it comes to to yeah. uh, overall human rights. We continue with uh, with uh, Mark Mark Lehman, uh, who is uh, who has been following in comprehensive way uh, the field of the human rights and especially interplay between technology companies, uh, governments, and the human rights community in general. Mark, uh, if you are still with us, uh, uh, could you uh, just add a few reflections on uh, on this underlying question that Ambas Ambassador said in her excellent introductory remark? Over to you, Mark. Okay, well, I apologize for disappearing. I had a very untimely electricity cut <laughs> at home just just as you gave the floor to the ambassador, so I guess it shows that all technology, not only digital technology, has its limits. Um, so I missed her speech, but I, I know from the narrative uh, before one of the questions were, was which of the, the particular rights are really called into question and do we need to look at, and you gave a, a list. My own uh, thoughts, not only in terms of the, the importance, but also the interesting implications are to freedom of expression um, and to privacy, of course. And I would very briefly take slightly different views on the implications of the current health crisis for those two rights. Uh, one, I think it's very obvious is in terms of freedom of expression. We're seeing some really worrying trends. Um, and I think that's linked with the idea, this growing idea that somehow the corona, coronavirus crisis is like war. It's, it's like we're on a war footing. And so we're seeing a lot of suppression, I think, of freedom of expression, both in terms of journalists that are increasingly criticized for asking difficult questions to governments because then the governments say they're being unpatriotic. Uh, or they're talking the country down. Uh, we saw this in the UK uh, just these past uh, 24 hours when a BBC journalist was asking the health secretary about when the ventilators were going to be, uh, extra ventilators were going to be delivered, and uh, the health secretary didn't like it, and the right wing, uh, the, the Tory party commentators and the, the government spokespeople didn't like it uh, because they they suggested this was somehow unpatriotic to ask uh, these difficult questions. And then even more extreme, we saw in the past 24 hours, a Guardian journalist uh, thrown out of Egypt uh, because uh, the, this lady questioned the government's figures on, on coronavirus cases. Um, so I think the worry, there are worrying trends on freedom of expression. On privacy, it's, I would say it's more interesting, I think less clear cut. I mean, obviously a very nice example is the, the digital the tagging idea, for example, in Korea, where people who uh, have coronavirus are essentially forced to download this app, which tags their uh, movements and also the government can look back at where they went in the past so they can track um of course for a lot of human rights people this would raise immediate uh concerns but i think as i said it's not necessarily as interesting as that because surveys in korea suggest that people are willing to uh, take this hit on their privacy in order to be safe and and to uh, avoid uh, the spread of the virus. I think that's really interesting questions. I suspect it's very different in in European Western democracies. People wouldn't accept this kind of um, imposition on their privacy, but it's, uh, yeah, it's not black and white. Thank you, Mark, for uh, revisiting this question of a trade-off. I did a short survey with uh, my social circle, people who are aware of uh, human rights, and I can tell you that uh, quite a few of them in this trade-off between privacy and uh, and they're based uh, mainly in Europe, they opted for the health and security. Therefore, that balance uh, uh, is not, I would say, only specificity for Korea or Koreans. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, but you prompted me to, to read just one short statement from Lee Soo Young, a, a psychiatrist at the Myeongji Hospital in South Korea. 
she, and she was quoted by BBC, BBC, she said exactly this. Some of my patients were more afraid of being blamed than dying of the virus. That's if we return back to the human-centered approach. It has so many layers. And of course, the question of shaming. Thank you for uh, bringing this dynamics and also pointing that this issue is open in many governments under the stress. You mentioned UK, Egypt, uh, Korea, and it's, it seems to be a universal challenge. Now we move uh, to, to Nairobi, to Nanjira. Uh, Nanjira, before you start reflecting on this development aspect, I would like to show one interesting survey which we did with the way how online education is uh, moved in classes in Italy, showing uh, literally north-south division with the province Emilia-Romagna having 83.9 acceptance and Sardinia 46% uh, acceptance of uh, online tools and in, in classrooms. Uh, is this question of, of uh, north-south divides, how is it reflected with regard to technology access and overall human rights? Over to you, Nanjira. Thanks, Jovan. And just like Mark, I've just suffered an electricity cut. So that there goes video, but I promise that's me. You can verify. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, right off the top of, of my mind, I mean, digital divides, you know, probably have been discussed on the fringes of different uh, topical issues. So typically, unless you're dealing with access to technology and internet, usually digital divides do not figure as the main conversation, maybe as a footnote when we're talking about the future of economies, fourth industrial revolution and all that. But what this has done is it's blown wide open and what digital divides look like, not just between those who are connected and connected, but also between those who are connected. So that we look at that particular poll you've shown about Italy, and you can clearly see a divide that follows particular geographical regions. Now, I don't know if the globally we're just going to be seeing north-south divides as, and unfortunately, a north looking better than the south kind of thing. But it's absolutely showing that even in uh, developed economies, there are people who are going to be left out all the more because those systems may, for example, in education, rely entirely on continuity through this virtual means. That means if you cannot assign, you know, uh, submit your assignment, you cannot uh, get access. If you do not have home access and what you've relied on previously was maybe a library, you're out of luck. So that um, in Kenya, for example, to, to flip it and look at this kind of situation, we are seeing divides too. The measures that the government has taken, obviously telecommuting as well, being encouraged to work from home, land from home are there. One key one though is that uh, for us, and you know, Kenya's home of MPEST, we've seen this for sure become a public utility because one of the measures has been to um, go cashless. And so what that has meant is that the government and the platforms, as far as money transfers go, have introduced incentives. So every activity from being on a public service transport to paying somebody for any service right now is primarily being encouraged either through mobile money or through um, debit and credit cards. But what that has done is has situated something that's in the hands of private players into becoming a public utility. Do we go back to a point where after this, cash can still be circulating in the economy? Or will people see this that, okay, we've gotten information on people we've not been able to see in the system before, let's keep it going kind of thing. That's going to be one key concern. We've also seen, um, I think to Peter's point earlier about PPPs jumping uh, in, where in the Kenya case, for example, the president uh, explained to us two days ago that uh, they've approved the Google's Project Loon in partnership with one of the telecommunication service providers here so the universal 4G through their balloons. So we're using the balloon emoji to talk about the universal access we're supposed to get. Um, and that's really interesting because whatever measures had been in or whatever was holding up that partnership was suddenly cleared and it will be important to go back and look into the terms of that and whether those will be made public. And we're seeing a lot more of um, apps as was, has been discussed in other areas being introduced to monitor movement and all of that. And of course, one thing that is becoming very clear and maybe to, to pivot is really that we're going to need new narratives around human rights. We are absolutely going to need to seek, we'll find a new way to engage, and especially the publics. Of course, we know government's argument is what are the alternatives? What should we do? You want us to contain this. We have to do what we feel is measurable. Whether there's research showing that surveillance is not it or not is secondary to the fact that it feels like it's one public sentiment as the way to go. So I'm thinking about this in terms of the narratives that we get publics to understand that this is not, is we are ushering ourselves into a very... Uh, uh, 
uh, danger, if you will, how do we actually find ways to communicate to the public that their right to privacy, yes, matters just as much as their right to health? Another narrative that we're struggling with, at least in the Kenyan case, is um, where we cannot revisit the systemic failures that have gotten us to this point where we are reacting fundamentally, for instance, the failure of public health investment and all of that. So that the narrative that many governments will have, I think, around the world, that this is not the time to revisit systemic failures, is another form of censorship if you think about it. Let's just react, let's fix this, and then we can revisit this at another time. So we are going to be, have to be very careful around um, thinking different in how we've always communicated as civil society, as other actors, on this language of human rights if we're going to imagine the other side with any semblance of them. Thank you. Nanjira, I'm always amazed how you managed to squeeze so many substantive con uh, content in such a limited time and you have to give us a course about speed talking or uh, reading. <laughs> And I must apologize if I've just sort of rumbled no, on. I was just trying to get as many points so we can get to discussions. <laughs> so and thank you for that. Uh, especially this question of new narratives, which I think Ambassador mentioned in her uh, statement. Also, also uh, Mark uh, mentioned as a question of language. What type of framing and language we have we have today? And uh, if we get with some concrete outputs, uh, and I'm hearing from the, this discussion for the creation of new narrative, it will be excellent. Now, uh, I can see very busy uh, chats in our uh, text chat room. Therefore, we'll hear soon from Andriana what's going over there and what are the ma major inputs. But we move to Scott. Scott, uh, now uh, we have this feeling that uh, hi hi history, I'm sorry, history accelerates. Some discussion net neutrality are just uh, swept by, by uh, reality. How is the office uh, of a uh, high commissioner adjusting to these changes? What are you doing? What is in the pipeline? Could you reflect more on uh, on those changes? Uh, Scott, floor is yours. No, thank you, thank you, Jovan, thank you, Ambassador, and all the other the other speakers. And I'll I'll try to be brief because I know we do want to save some time for the the, the discussion. But before I speak about the work of the office, I do want to just pick up on a couple of important points that were made, and I think the last one. Uh, by Nanjira about the, the digital divide and systemic failures. Um, because I, in particular, on um, the need to build resilient health systems and how that hasn't been done uh, worldwide, and in particular in ways that are inclusive, that um, take into account uh, marginalization and, and discrimination. Um, I think that is uh, a fundamental rights issue that um, is not being um, fully discussed and put on the table today. And leads me back a little bit to the poll we, that you put out at the beginning, Jovan, which I found very interesting. And I, I guess I, I would have voted for perhaps none of the above and looked at really just a, what I think is a more fundamental um, issue, obviously, of the, the right to life but linked with uh, access to health care and access to health information. But my main human rights concern really is about uh, the right to life, right to health care for those that are not part of the conversation today. I think in, in many ways, our conversation today is one among those on one side of the digital divide. But my, my main concern, and the issue is not to, not to belittle the importance, I think there, there's some crucial issues today. Uh, and we are in a, a zone uh, of great transition and acceleration of human rights risks. But honestly, my more fundamental concern is how this uh, crisis will impact those that are that have no access to to the internet, very to the internet, very little access to technology that have been marginalized. Those in conflict zones, um, parts of Central Africa, Central Asia, elsewhere, where people have uh, very little access to to technology. And my concern is just what the impact of this crisis will be in those those zones where we have so little information and there is so so little access to to information. Um, I think also I'll I'll jump ahead. I think the other the other colleagues really touched on some key questions of how this time is uh, accelerating risks to freedom of expression, facilitating repression uh, thereof. In particular, of journalists. I think Mark made some some very important references there. Also, the question you have on of necessary and proportionate, um, and how that is being um, defined uh, in this particular particular time of of crisis. Uh, and there, I think there's much more work that does need to be done um, by the Human Rights Council, by the special procedures, by the treaty bodies, by our office, uh, and, and by by others. Um, and then also just to underscore the, I think the crucial point uh, that Peter 
Peter made and others pointed to that protecting human rights and protecting human rights in the online space, I think does go hand in hand uh, with the public health response. And that's a, a point that our high commissioner has made that keeping human rights at the center of the response uh, is so important, protecting the most vulnerable uh, in society will be so important to having an overall successful response um, to the crisis. And coming from a high commissioner who has both the background of a medical professional and the head of state who has dealt with emergencies, I think it's a particularly uh, pertinent message. Um, I'll, I'll jump ahead on a number of points. I think the right to privacy and surveillance has already been um, been, been, been mentioned. Our office has been working um, in the short run with the special procedures uh, in support of the treaty bodies, obviously our high commissioner, uh, in doing uh, as much public advocacy, public messaging uh, as we can at this point to try to push policies and responses of governments uh, towards a human rights-based approach. Um, there was the ambassador mentioned some of the statements from the high commissioner and the special procedures, um, but these statements that, that we put out point to um, indeed a lifting of sanctions for humanitarian reasons. Uh, our secretary general, of course, has called for um, a laying down of arms. Um, our treaty bodies have put out messages also calling for uh, a human rights based uh, approach. Um, the high commissioner, the special rapporteur, uh, on racial discrimination have raised the importance of combating uh, xenophobia and racism at this particular time. So we're putting a lot of energy uh, into public messaging, public advocacy, uh, and trying to, uh, to change policy as broadly as possible. Uh, more specifically within the UN, we're very active uh, in developing the, uh, the internal response to the UN and in providing support and guidance to UN teams uh, around the world that are doing their best to um, to respond uh, on, on the ground and in some of the most challenging uh, places. Scott, let's leave some of these points for the, thank you for this this, this sure. good, uh, summary and referring to, to the previous statements. Now, we are asking Andriana almost mission impossible to summarize <laughs> this really rich discussion. I think we have already five pages of text in the, in the, in the, in the text box. I don't know if she's going to, if she will try to, to summarize it or, uh, Andriana, are you ready? Could you join us? Oh, I'm ready. Oh. As ready as I can be. Um, the chat started with um, a very um, uh, philosophical discussion on what is the most important human rights. Some said that, well, I'm not happy to say that some human rights are more important than the others. And then the conclusion was, uh, that uh, all rights are equal and indivisible, but that the prerequisite is the right to life. Because as uh, Richard said it, if you are dead, you don't have any rights. Um, the, uh, Bala Dada pointed out that what we can learn from the pandemic is that reactions and narratives show that some rights will be shown as more important than the others. And then there were some comments and questions that were concerned with the long-term issues uh, from Ginger, who said that uh, it's very important to know what will be the long-term effect. Uh, will the measures be reassigned or will they become the status quo? Um, Fasil Yilma pointed out that uh, there is interest to employ digital tech to fight COVID, but even at cost of fundamental human rights. And he asked if we can then see the human rights as conditional. Uh, from our Facebook live stream, we have Luca Brunner, who said that um, he disagrees that the current global human rights law is enough guidance for the use of technology in crisis times. And uh, asked, in the case of the COVID crisis, how can we make sure that, for example, the use of cell phone data is only limited to the time frame of the crisis? So another long-term question. I think that will be it for now, Jovan, over to you. Oh, sorry, I forgot one thing. Apologies, Ambassador, your keynote uh, touched two participants and they were very interested in having it in a written form. Uh, we will certainly uh, include all the important points from your address in our, in our summary as well. But if you would be interested, I do believe we could uh, publish the entire keynote by itself. And now it's over to you, Yolan. Apologies. 
Andriana, it's fascinating. I have to con consult later on the chat uh, transcript to see if you covered all aspects, but it seems that you, you did a fascinating uh, job. Thank you. Uh, in the comments, what we heard what Scott mentioned that right to life is ultimately ultimate uh, underlying uh, right. And uh, what maybe in the next uh, uh, 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, we have to reflect with our uh, panelists are a few questions. There is a question, obviously, of trade-off. Peter argued that we don't need necessarily to make trade-off. And it's great to find the areas where we don't need a trade-off. But uh, certainly in some fields, we have to make trade-offs. Because uh, like the question of privacy and, uh, for example, surveillance. Then there was a question about concrete measures. What can be done in Geneva? This is extremely important. And I have a feeling that uh, we haven't delivered yet to ambassadors invitation to give a concrete ideas. That will be important. And not only ambassador the, uh, request. I've been receiving uh, requests from friends. Uh, they said, hey, you guys in Geneva, why you don't do something on, for example, uh, banning the increase, sharp increase in prices on the masks or the or the or this uh, uh, necessary materials for people to uh, save them? Can WTO do something? This is a different discussion. But there will be more and more pressure on concrete action and concrete issues from communities worldwide. Therefore, we have this, uh, this few uh, question of trade-offs, question of uh, concrete measures and concrete reaction. Because this is unique time and the uh, international system has to react fast uh, and, uh, and uh, really with tangible uh, impacts as much as it is legally possible. Now, with those few points, I would like to, to return to our uh, panelists to uh, reflect on some question. I uh, left uh, Peter's uh, excellent introduction uh, with the question of concrete measures. What we can do specifically? Do we need a new convention? Do we need a special procedure and guidelines on, for example, protecting uh, or forcing uh, uh, actors to delete data once the crisis is over, once it is over? Also to discuss a bit the uh, question of day after, what will happen of day after, after the corona crisis? Is, are the some uh, restrictions of human rights going to be new normal or are we going to revisit them? Now, Peter, we start with you with, and then we'll move through the other panelists and the ambassador will uh, summarize the uh, discussion and see if he delivered on the, her call to provide concrete inputs. Peter. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I think we need, first of all, written agreements. Um, what we're seeing right now is uh, GSMA, um, for example, uh, and other telcos having phone conversations with, with world leaders, with governments, um, and agreeing to all sorts of data sharing. Um, just get a one-page, two-page agreement saying, this is what we agreed to. Here's the sunset clause. Um, at which point we, we would need to renew uh, these data sharing agreements, and this is the scope. Um, let's start there. Let's not. Uh, this is not the time to build a, some overarching convention. Let's just be clear about what is being asked of of um, tux companies to hand over right now. Um, when it comes to the apps, that is the response. That's the go-to. Is governments rolling out apps that um, you know we can be sure are not well tested, um, have security holes, um, and uh, you know, this is the first crisis in the digital age like this, where everyone is is, is pointing to apps as the response. Um, but it's not going to be the only one. So what we want to do is increase trust in institutions, so people, um, you know, still see this as a way to contribute. We want people to share their health information with consent. Um, and uh, to download these apps and use them, but they're not going to do that next time if these apps are insecure, if they're, you know, remain in place, and if people later see the data being handed over used against them. And right now we are seeing people who share data and then receive death threats um, once their information is leaked or exposed and published. Um, so we're talking about the right to life. Um, we need people to share their data. Information will save lives, but they're not going to do that if they feel insecure or um, uh, unprotected. Mark, uh, the Peter, then uh, two pages, simple language, understandable to everybody, produced hopefully by the um, UN Human Rights Council or some uh, international organization, uh, and explaining these key points that can be translated, not necessarily in language, we can translate in 610 language, but translated to the con uh, concerns of everybody. 
would access now be uh, ready to initiate something uh, some this drafting exercise uh, along these lines over data sharing templates is is a good idea i think where international institutions um, can facilitate this um, templates for these apps that governments are rolling out um, that have clear terms probably icon based not even just language but icons um, and uh, yes access now stands ready to support and uh, most of civil society would as well Thank you. Now we move uh, quickly to uh, to uh, to uh, um, to Mark. Mark, you are from civil society community. You interact more with governments and the tech sector. How do you see one concrete initiative like this initiative on the question of privacy? You can also reflect on freedom of expression. What could be tangible measure that Human Rights Council, but also international community, can make? Well, I mean, you, you asked for what concrete measures uh, and quickly um, could the Human Rights Council do. As you know, the, the UN and the Human Rights Council are not so good at, at concrete and quick uh, measures, um, but there are a number of things that can, can be done. And we were due to talk about a lot of these things with the President of the Council at this year's Glee on Human Rights Dialogue, um, which, of course, has unfortunately been postponed because of the crisis. My experience in the preparation for that Cleon dialogue, but also a lot of work we've been doing recently on hate speech online and fake news online, uh, which brings to the table a lot of what you termed trade-offs. Um, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, freedom of expression, for example. Well, you talked about the trade-offs in privacy, on privacy issues and, and the right to health. But on freedom of expression, a good example is the discussions around fake news as it relates to this crisis. Um, and one example, I think, serves to illustrate that. Uh, Singapore recently came up with a new law on uh, fake news online, um, which has been, you know, was heavily criticized by a lot of Western NGOs and by Western governments. Um, but actually, it turned out it was quite useful in the context of this crisis. And why is that? Because at one at one moment, uh, a rumor started spreading by fake news online in Singapore that there was one particular metro station, where which was kind of the new epicenter of coronavirus in Singapore. And so everybody was avoiding that station, and it was creating huge traffic jams, huge problems in terms of circulation. And so under the new law, Singapore put up a, a note or well, they forced the social media companies to put up a note with the truth that there was no big coronavirus outbreak at this metro station. So I think that shows the balance between yeah, freedom of expression on the one side, but also you know, protecting against societal harm on the other. And I think one thing that that shows, which the Human Rights Council should learn in terms of concrete next steps, is not necessarily about you know, two pages or resolutions or new special procedures. It's just that it's really an increasingly important for, for governments to start working more closely with technology companies. Um, about a month and a half ago, we organized a, a roundtable discussion with 20 ambassadors from the Human Rights Council and Facebook. Uh, including the new Vice President for Human Rights of, of Facebook. And that was the first time in my experience in 12 years in Geneva that there'd been any real substantive engagement between the social media companies or the, the, inter, the digital companies with governments. And I think that's crucial because any solutions, any it's no good for the Human Rights Council to pass a resolution telling everybody what needs to happen. Uh, if they don't have the social media and the internet companies and the digital technology companies on board. And so we need to be doing a lot more of that. And one of the things that should come from this crisis is to learn the lesson that, you know, ideology is bad, practical solutions are good. And the only way in this sphere to have practical policy solutions is for governments, the private sector and civil society to work together uh, and come up with those very practical solutions themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Just a few points, and uh, Scott and Anjira can reflect on that. Uh, Scott, I know that you have your ambassador in Silicon Valley, and you have been trying to engage uh, tech companies. Practically speaking, if you have these two pages drafted uh, by governments uh, with Access Now and others, and uh, 
would they be interested to join this drafting process? Uh, what is the, the level of commitment? My feeling that's more, it's not informed, it's more intuition or feeling, is that they feel mm. like doing something useful in this decisive moment and they're ready to engage. Uh, do you have a, a ways to engage? Do you have a ways to involve? And then Nanjira, after Scott, just question for you to think. You, you mentioned new na narratives and now Mark mentioned it's not time for ideology. And we can see uh, to what extent the current narratives and current ideologies in inverted commas can serve us. Scott, to you and then to Nanjira. Yeah, very quickly, Johan. I think um, tech companies are increasingly uh, interested in engaging uh, in response to the crisis in the short run and on human rights um, in, the, in the long run. Um, if you look at what Facebook has done in response to the crisis, they have a very interesting blog on the various measures that, that they've taken. Um, if you look at uh, what um, Dropbox and 24 other companies in the Silicon Valley area have done in terms of humanitarian response, I think many of them are, um, are stepping up and interested in responding in the short run. Uh, in the long run also, I think um, what we need to do with companies and with member states is ask them to commit very squarely to the UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights. Uh, we're very engaged with tech companies uh, on a regular basis um, on a project that asks them to practically apply those principles uh, to the tech sector. And uh, of note, I think what, what companies uh, need to commit to and commit to now uh, is carrying out human rights due diligence and doing impact assessments on the human rights impact of the many new apps, many new policies that are being applied. It's a tall order in a time of crisis, um, but I think it is of, of crucial importance that it that it be done, and that in particular, um, looping back to, to Peter's point, um, the companies uh, do have sunset clauses, governments have sunset uh, clauses written into many of the policies um, that are being rolled out today and the use of the apps uh, in particular ways to, to track and surveil today. Well, Scott, we can uh, expect positive answer if you invite them into this drafting exercise. I'm just doing a hypothetical, making hypothetical situation, but we can have them uh, around the table joining us, or in this case, virtual table, in preparing this two-pager, which Peter mentioned in his uh, initial statement. Nanjira, what are we going to do with the ideology? <laughs> Yeah, well, coming from the global south, I know for a fact that any ideology, it's never been time for it. Our ideologies, our ideas of how indivisible human rights are have never gotten time of day. So, you know, this is just another in the long line of crises or moments that we've been told to put it on the back, background. But I must say ideology doesn't mean inertia. Just because things are difficult doesn't mean we can't do what's right. Because even the principle of do no harm that's supposed to be out there, for now it's going to become an afterthought because people will be busy rolling out things that are supposed to be the solution, the panacea and all of that. Solutionism is about to become the ideology. And so if we're not ready to, um, motivate, uh, to, to actually engage on the things that we know absolutely are going to be necessary guardrails, if you will, we'll continue doing this. And by the time we emerge out of a series of crises, if we assume this is just going to be one in a string of many, we'll never have moved into alternatives. So I refuse and I reject that notion that ideology has never had time because it's never had time and we'll never have time if we continue at this rate. Good. Nanjir, I guess uh, uh, Mark referred to the ideologized discussion, but I think that you, there is an agreement. We need the practical steps, but there is also need to revisit some old narratives and traditional narratives in time of crisis because the situation is accelerating very fast. We have very limited uh, time now for the concluding remarks. We asked the survey. We want your informed consent to extend the session because we promised to have it only one hour. But I guess uh, uh, if there are no any really pressing, pressing uh, uh, points that our panelists would like to raise before I pass the floor to Ambassador. Uh, that would be, okay, we have two answers with yes, but uh, we have a silent majority which probably have uh, something else after this uh, session. Uh, Mark, Nanjira, Peter, uh, uh, Mike, is there anything absolutely important that you would like to raise on this point? Or we will just, we'll invite Ambassador to provide the summary points. Mm, okay, Mark. We cannot hear you, Mark. Probably you're muted. It's not intentional. We want to hear your voice. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, Go. okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, on this uh, point of ideology, I mean, of course, I didn't mean to say that we shouldn't be 
all government policy shouldn't be guided by the international human rights obligations and commitments. It must be. My point was that, you know, that we shouldn't allow ourselves to be drawn into an ideological battle with one group of people insisting on full, um, full freedom of expression and no limits whatsoever on freedom of expression. Here I'm talking about the, the example of fake news. And the other side, uh, Egypt being a good example that I gave, uh, thinking that in times of crisis or in times of war, every human right can be suppressed or limited if it mean if it's for the so-called greater good. Um, so we shouldn't fall into that kind of ideological battle. We should be guided by international human rights standards, principles, obligations, but really look at what works, uh, especially in the context of this terrible crisis, um, and, and basically try to learn the lessons from that so that in the future we can respond in a way that respects and protects human rights but also allows us to address these crises in a much better way. Thank you, Mark. I, in a way, created a bit of artificial uh, 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 dynamics here. I know what you meant in this uh, context and thank you for uh, clarifying that. Uh, we are having now, there are many questions that I wanted to raise in our discussion, like Nanjira is really passionate uh, advocate for the proper use of digital identity projects. We haven't managed to tackle that and with other speakers as well. Now, I think we have a quite, uh, we have also a lot of comments in uh, discussion. We may just ask Andriana for quick summary and we are already three minutes over the proposed time before we pass the floor for, uh, to to Ambassador. Andriana, go ahead. Thank you for the floor, Jovan. Uh, this time around, we have had a lot more questions than comments, so I can read them out, but I don't think our speakers have the time to address them. Uh, in any case, here, uh, here are the biggest concerns. How can you protect the online human rights of the most vulnerable when they are not even online? Uh, how does the COVID crisis converge with uh, human rights crisis for, from climate change? Uh, then uh, the rights to a healthy life, uh, meaning that a lot of participants brought up uh, the environmental and climate aspects uh, of, uh, of, the, of the crisis. Uh, and also uh, something that Nigeria already uh, addressed in the chat is the concept of data free flow with trust. I do think that this was um, connected to Regina's comment on knowing how personal data can be used and abused, is it not counterproductive to create, create trust in uh, health data apps? I would stop here now, Jovan, over to you again. Thank you, thank you, Andriana. Uh, one of the principal uh, Diplo and Geneva Internet Platform is that there is no unanswered question or comment. What we are going to do, we'll uh, collect your uh, questions and comments sent to our uh, panelists and in the follow-up message that you will receive tomorrow, you will receive a question or comments on your question. Um, Ambassador, you uh, uh, put quite a, right, a high bar for us to provide concrete ideas and suggestions. Uh, what is your view now, now after this one uh, hour of interesting uh, discussion? Could you provide us a few summary points and may maybe some hints how we can continue this discussion? Over to you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as you have already guessed, it is very difficult to summarize this very rich uh, discussion, which had many different aspects. I'll, I'll try to do my best, but it, it certainly won't be satisfactory. Um, on the question of what human rights are affected, I think there was an agreement that the right to life is sort of the overarching human right we're talking about, and that includes the right to health and the right to be informed about your health. But then there were the rights to expression, free expression and, and assembly, the right to privacy, um, the right not to be discriminated against, um, special rights of the vulnerable. And in general, the problem surrounding the digital divide, uh, which is a divide very often between countries, but also a divide within societies. So we, I, we have, for example, in my country that it's much more difficult for children from poor families who maybe have a bi migrant background to follow school online than for children which come from relatively educated families, just to give an example. Um, a lot was said about the trade-off that is necessary to be made between measures currently necessary against 
against the background of the crisis on the one hand and the human rights on the other hand. And I think that there was an agreement to say it is all right that special measures are being taken at the moment because they are necessary to protect people's health. So the question is not if, but the question is how. And the answer to that must be that measures need to be proportionate, both in terms of density as well as in terms of time. They can only last as long as it's necessary for the crisis and there should be some kind of a sunset arrangement that when they're no necessary anymore, they will be stopped. There was also quite some talk about the narrative, um, meaning that to what extent um, is public opinion obliged to put aside all other issues at the time of crisis? You could call that a kind of censorship. You could call it other things. It reminds me personally a bit of these arguments which we constantly struggle with, which are being put forward by some governments uh, against the full enjoyment of human rights, things like we have to fight terrorism, this is about national sovereignty and so on. And now we have a new argument, we have a health crisis. And this is why human rights may be limited. That's right, but only to a certain extent. Then the problem was mentioned of some people benefiting or rather misusing the prison crisis. Things like circulating counterfeit medical supplies, also things like raising prices uh, in order to benefit from this crisis, which is a huge emergency for almost everybody else. Um, what is the program for the day after? That is a very difficult one. Do we need new instruments? Personally, I don't think we necessarily new, need new instruments, but that, that is debatable, of course. What, however, I think everybody agreed to is that whatever we have needs to be trusted. Uh, if we want to make the best possible use of digital instruments, and we do want to do this, then we also have to have rules how this is being done. And these rules should not only uh, apply to governance, um, but also to non-state actors like business. And that can be a big problem. Uh, we mostly think about big tech giants which come from the United States of America and, and which would have to respect legislation if there was one. But then there are many non-state actors as well who wouldn't respect the legislation if it were in place. So I think it's not only sufficient to have rules, it would be equally important to have oversight over these rules so that people can trust they're actually being applied. We have soft law like the guiding principles by Mr. Ruggi on business and human rights, but we've had those for a while and they're not being respected. Uh, so what is needed is practical st steps far away from ideology now to help in the crisis, but also later on. I can only promise that we will keep thinking in the Human Rights Council how best to participate to this. in this. Uh, what I forgot to say is that the Human Rights Council is in a position to do certain things also virtually, via the media. Um, informal meetings would be possible. We could have, and we're thinking about this, organizing something informally, but with interesting speakers. The only thing which is really not possible, as far as I can see it, is to hold fully fledged meetings of the Human Rights Council with full interpretation as it is necessary for formal meetings with the technologies we have. So I, I don't blame uh, all of you for not having all the answers to these very difficult questions, what the Human Rights Council can do right now to benefit as best as possible from the current crisis. But what I can promise is that we'll keep thinking and trying our best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for, for really excellent summary. Fortunately, you have a transcript, thanks to Zoom technology, uh, of, uh, of this uh, great points that you raised in the introduction summary and all of our panelists. We had almost everything. We had electricity cut in uh, Nairobi, but also in Geneva. We had... Uh, um. uh, uh, in. France, I'm in mean, Devon. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It, it, was only, it was only my house because oh, okay. there was too many appliances. <laughs> okay, then we cannot generalize. Then we had an excellent comments from our panelists and I would like to thank them. I'm sure you will be hearing now if you were in, in situ, great applause uh, from our uh, um, participants. And uh, they really, the questions, comments that were raised are uh, equally substantive that were raised in the chat room. 
following we'll have the following steps you will receive tomorrow's summary you will receive the uh, summary of the transcript you will see video recording of the session and uh, uh, in general we are really open for the next uh, debates count on us uh, many ideas were raised by access now by um, all of our panelists uh, feel free whenever we can uh, help to to uh, approach us to organize a webinar or maybe ambassador to discuss these technical limitations for the meeting i think we can provide some solutions if uh, there will be there will be or, or ideas how to solve it the time is uh, difficult there is a lot of pressure on all of us but uh, as uh, chinese character for crisis shows the in, in addition to the bad aspect of crisis there are also opportunities we are shifted out of our comfort zone and we may create uh, some new solutions and uh, make the world better on the day after which remains the key issue ahead of us what will happen after we get rid of this uh, terrible coronavirus i wish you a lot of uh, personal uh, first good health happiness smart ways to uh, to navigate isolations if you are in isolation and uh, uh, keep in touch and see you soon. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.